So, so, there, so that's what he called the noble truths. So the first one is the symptoms of the unenlightened life, which is the self-centered, both metaphysically self-centered by thinking that the self is the most important and greatest reality and it's a fixed and almost an, even an absolute almost sort of thing. Never change my real identity. You know? And uh, um, that the unenlightened life stuck that way will be frustrating because there will be the suffering that the happiness, the, the momentary relief and happiness, what, what people think of as mundane happiness, temporary relief from anxiety, depression, and addiction, <laughs> that moment, those moments of momentary relief will not last. They will come to an end rather quickly. So it's called the suffering of change. The, the happiness is called the suffering of change. And then the suffering of suffering is obvious. You know, that we, we hurt ourselves, you know, we feel anxious, depressed, and, and, uh, and addicted. And then uh, the, the, the suffering of the overall structure of you being separate from the universe and you not be, be and therefore being basically ultimately, temporarily, ultimately, and cosmically, ultimately, if you become more aware, overwhelmed by the other of the persons and things, which is <coughs> vast, vastness around you, which you're afraid of, of which many aspects of which you're afraid and frustrated by and whatever. So, so that's the first noble truth. But then the, then the second noble truth is that that suffering of yours has a cause, the origin of it, what it is. Now that's the diagnosis, why you're suffering. And there that is this, this delusion. Ignorance is not as good a word for it as delusion, although I do use a more cognitive word than delusion, but which is the same as delusion, which is misknowledge, or like misunderstanding, because it's more importantly than a passive failure to know something, it's a wrong knowing of something. Like every person who is unenlightened, who lives an unexamined life, they know that they are the main thing. They know that. They know I'm me. They know that I'm different from everything else. They, they may have a, they sort of, and it's, a, it's a weird kind of knowing because they actually haven't found themselves as different from everybody else. They are just conditioned to assume they are different from everybody else. And therefore that assumption is so ingrained and so strongly habituated at the subconscious, visceral, instinctual level, as well as the conscious level, that they assume that there's a, there's a me in here, a point of subjectivity, that is somehow apart from what I'm subjective of, that is what I am, the, the, the consciousness that perceives, that never changes, no matter what happens to me. I'm always me. When I see a picture of myself at 15 at a picnic, if I can remember the situation, I sort, of, I sort of identify, oh yeah, that's, I'm the same me now, 50 years later, 60 years later, I'm exactly the same, although of course I'm utterly different, but I, there's a point, seems to me to be a point that never changed, and that's my identity, even though I never really found it, but I feel that's, that's it's there. Then there are theories that say, yes, of course that's true, you have this fixed immortal soul that never changes, that's the real you, it's like some kind of barcode, created by mm. some absolute being that's outside of the universe, spark of that absolute being, for example, in most monotheistic traditions, they have a thing like that. And um, materialists have a sort of nothingness that never changes. It's because the brain is just making an illusion that I'm here, but my, I've never changed being nothing, not having a mind or a soul, etc. You know, they're all different versions. So theories will reinforce that feeling that there's something unchanging at the root of all my subjective experience. So, and that is a misknowledge. That is the delusion. And then that's elaborated, very complicated. And from the, once there is that delusion, that the real thing is this real me, sort of stuck temporarily in this, in this interrelatedness that is very problematic, 
then I automatically sort of want more, I want to be bigger, I want to consume more, I want to dominate more of this apparent infinity around me to sort of be able to withstand it, to stand up to it, to overcome, like I like to be a king or a god, or, you know, somehow become bigger than, than the other. So that's a greed. That's a, that's a, I want to join more things. That's a lust and greed and desire. You know? Secondary to this primal illusion. And then, uh, since that's what I want in this hopeless situation, I assume every other being wants the same thing, and therefore they want to kind of consume me. And so I'm aggressive with them, and I hate those who want to do that. And so then hatred, aggression, hostility, aversion, people sort of politely say, hmm. I have it. And that's Freud's Eros and Thanatos, right? Mm -hmm. I, that, you know. But they are secondary to um, the delusion, the, the, the delusive sense of separateness, an absolute separateness of self and the universe. Okay? So those are, that's the diagnosis, that's the, the acknowledgement of the symptom, and the diagnosis of the cause of the symptom. Now the prognosis, and this is of course what, why Buddha himself was a happy camper, why he said, like an elixir of immortality is this, is this reality that I have discovered, which is profound, meaning it's the real bottom deep reality, it's peaceful, it's luminous, it's uncomplicated, and uncreated, it's always been there. And now I, it's, so it's the reality that I've always been, isn't it? What a relief. And. Uh, so the reason he's feeling relieved uh, is that's the prognosis. And in his knowledge of the nature of it, since he was a self-centered, spoiled brat prince who'd been the, the love of everybody in his culture and society, and he'd been in the top power position, he was about to be king. Father was very upset that he, wouldn't, that he couldn't abdicate and, and coronate him at, because he'd reached the moment of that by having a son. In an Indian royal system, uh, who, and uh, in that time in the Indian society, the royal people were more powerful than the priest people or the intellectual people, you know, because military, military, they were the military people, and they had, they, although the Brahmins will tell you they were superior, they actually weren't. The, the Department of Defense was in charge, as, as still they are, and. Uh, 